I'd now like to move on to our second speaker, Rob Beardsworth. Rob's an urban designer and conservation officer and town planner. The last 16 years have seen him in various roles, including working for the City of York, Cave, uh, and most recently Hull, where he currently runs the council's urban design function. Rob is also a member of the Yorkshire Design Review Panel. Over to you, Rob. Super. OK, thanks for the, the uh, introduction. Um, Save me a job. Um, I just wanted to talk about uh, the role of a local authority urban designer first. Um, so I'll probably describe it as being both reactive and proactive. Reactive in, in terms of I'm probably, well, I am the lead in terms of appraising um, the kind of design quality of, of schemes that could get submitted to the city. Uh, and then uh, undertaking that ensuing uh, negotiation that then takes place uh, through the planning process. Uh, but also, thankfully, a lot of proactive stuff as well, whether that's been involved in pre-application discussions, setting design briefs, uh, site briefs, through master planning um, and producing uh, the city's design guidance. Okay. So apologies to, to the host, but I've slightly um, reworded the presentation. Um, because I think when I've reflected on the kind of last 16 years that I've been involved in, in various kind of master plans or master planning, um, for me, I think um, a good master plan um, is the product of a good master planning process. So I'm really gonna talk about that process and some of the, the kind of common themes that are within a, a, a successful master plan. Um, so I'm gonna talk hopefully very positively, positively about master planning. Um, I just wanted a slide here to, to really just make a point around how in a lot of or, or the vast majority of the, the discussions I have around place, um, a lot of that initial chat and aspiration is often about the places we, we like and we want to create. Um, and often it's around historic town centres and more compact urban grain, essentially places for people. Um, and I think the elephant in the room does start to creep in a little bit. Um, and a lot of that initial aspiration later on starts to be slightly undermined um, by some unspoken kind of um, requirements that come in later. So I think if we're gonna have effective master planning, successful master planning, I think a little bit more openness and realism at the start um, if certain aspects of highways design need to be applied, then let's have those conversations up front when we're talking about grain and building heights and things like that. They need to be discussed early on, else we don't want to promise one thing and then deliver another. Um, and I think if we're accepting that these uh, certain technical standards have to apply, then okay, but let's bring them out at the start and have those discussions uh, because I think the result is, is always going to be better. Uh, so I was given 10 minutes to talk about uh, master planning, and this maybe says a lot about my kind of um, way I've been thinking in lockdown, but uh, 15 minute meals came in. Uh, so I started thinking about the ingredients of master planning. Somewhere in there, there's a really bad joke about uh, the ingredients for a master flan, but I decided to leave that one out, thankfully. thankfully. Um, but anyway, here are three ingredients that are, have always been present in um, any master planning process I've been in that I can confidently say it's been successful. Um, so I'm going to introduce these topics one by one. Um, there's not long, so it's really just going to be a brief introduction and hopefully you can then kind of ruminate on them, what they maybe mean for your area, the work you do. Um, so first of all, what I've called looking beyond boundaries. So this is all about context, okay? Uh, so I'm going to use a couple of uh, examples as I go through. This one um, is the fruit market hull, which some of you will be familiar with, some of you it may be the first time you're hearing about it. It's a, it's a peninsula um, and it's really surrounded on three sides by water as you can see. Um, and this next slide shows to the north, it's really cut off from the rest of the city of Hull uh, by this A road that runs through and takes kind of really heavy traffic from the docks in the east of the city out west really to serve the rest of the UK. Um, and you can see the impact of that road and that severance has had on the, the kind of peninsula the fruit market area. You know, wherever you see surface car parking um, to that extent, uh, and a kind of vacant land in the city centre, it's a kind of clue that something's not quite right. 
So it was clear uh, to the city and all involved that if we were going to be successful in master planning and, and kind of turning around the fortunes of, of that fruit market area, we were going to have to stitch it back in uh, to the rest of the city and forge that connection back. Now, this is a, a CGI because um, I've not been able to get out and about as much as I, I would like to, but you know, this stunning new pedestrian and cycle bridge is now in place. And it's absolutely one of the key ingredients to the kind of future success of, of the master plan of the fruit market, making that connection back into the city and kind of overcoming that barrier. So staying on the same topic, but maybe sidestepping slightly, um, because looking beyond boundaries and forging connections isn't necessarily about physical connections. Um, it's also about looking outside the boundaries of our sites and, and, and really learning from the bits we like I've used the term observe, absorb and reinterpret. And that's the message I've put in the um, whole residential design guide. And this is an example from York, Derwentport, where the architects on this scheme have done a brilliant job. They've looked at New Earswick, which is a, a garden village development in York, um, an original garden village development, and they've taken inspiration from it. It's not a copy, they've taken inspiration and produce this kind of wonderful modern contemporary take on the garden village. So the, the second ingredient is co-authorship. I'm not going to spend too long talking to a group of, of planners about the need for stakeholder engagement and consultation, um, but co-authorship is key. Uh, the image I've used, the front cover of um, Urban Design um, uh, magazine, is kind of to show children as one group. And it's really important to get those different narratives into the master planning process. Um, I use a technique of, of mind mapping, uh, which can tell you an awful lot, actually. Actually, just as a, you know, if you're working on a site, a really good thing to do is do this on your own. You don't have to tell anyone about the results of it, but it can produce some really telling kind of insights. And this is simply just a blank piece of paper and a pen, no visual clues, so no maps, no Google Earth, no photographs, just a blank piece of paper and a pen and three minutes five minutes ask someone to draw their place so it might be their estate it might be their city center their town center their village whatever it is the master plan is 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 for um so for instance when we were looking at whole city center i did this exercise with, with a group and it was really telling that from i think the youngest participant was maybe seven uh, and all the mind maps we got from that kind of younger age group from seven right through to probably 16 it was really interesting that the fruit market, that peninsula I showed you earlier, just wasn't in their, their mind maps. So there's all sorts we can learn from that. But the two kind of big points I took from that was one, okay, at that time, there were kind of gig venues down in the fruit market, places to eat. And it was more about the evening economy. So maybe it wasn't somewhere where, you know, under 16s um, would spend a lot of time and therefore maybe it wasn't in their consciousness. But also, again, the power of that road, not only was it a huge physical barrier in the city, but it was so strong that actually it was a barrier to people's mind's eye. So it was doing these mind maps tells you an awful lot about a place. So if you're working on a site, put the maps away, the images away, get your piece of paper, do a mind map of your site, and it'll tell you an awful lot about what you do and don't know about your site. And then you can then obviously fill the gaps of your knowledge after that. Um, Co-authorship brings in all the software. By the software, I mean not the, the road infrastructure, the streets, the buildings, but I mean that kind of magic dust, the temporary stuff, temporary school, the markets, the artwork, the play places, the imaginative stuff. So on to the third uh, and final ingredient, um, what I'm going to talk about today is the third dimension. This is kind of the cornerstone of, of planning, really, this kind of two-dimensional layout drawing, which I think everyone will be kind of familiar with. Um, but this third dimension, what I mean, I'm really talking about evolving layouts. Now, I don't mean necessarily just being able to draw that in 3D, although that really helps. It's great to be able to use this type of drawing, especially when we're engaging with, with stakeholders, members of the public. We can test different ideas, um, different heights, different enclosure ratios, etc. cetera. Um, but what I mean by um, the third dimension evolving layouts is really getting under the skin of your layout. So the fruit market master plan was informed by analysis of Hull City Centre, um, the historic core. So looking at the fact that it was made up of fairly tight, compact urban blocks, those urban blocks were generally perimeter, 
with a public front and internal uh, courtyards in the centre. And also the makeup of those blocks created really interesting vertical rhythms, quite narrow plots, each building um, very different or often very different architecturally, created a really rich kind of um, urban fabric. And the other thing was permeability. A lot of these tight blocks um, had what we might call locally stace or, or alleyways just kind of punctuating through them. And it was something that we really liked within the existing historic fabric we had. So this is us, this is the master plan, really just laying those breadcrumbs for the later the design teams, the architects to pick up on. Um, and the picture's not brilliant because it's under construction, but this is one of those urban blocks and you can see how we've, we've put that alleyway through um, and the positioning of it. And you might be able to tell from the photograph, but it just picks out the, uh, where the break is in the building line. It just picks out the, uh, the top of the Minster Tower, which is further north over that, that A63 road. So just to elaborate on the theme, on the topic, um, the other key characteristic, or one of the other key characteristics about Hull Old Town is its, um, its kind of varied and dynamic roof lines. So again, analysis took place of what we had, different heights, different roof forms. And again, the master plan is then prescriptive. Again, it's laying those breadcrumbs for the, the kind of design work to come. And the developers have done a really good job. This is a photograph of, of one of a part of the fruit market, which is residential in nature. And you can see all residential buildings, but each plot, narrow plots in each building, a slightly different roof line, just to, to pick up the observes and absorbed and reinterpreted that key feature of Hull Old Town into the, the new development. So that kind of brings my time to an end. So just to recap, really, those three ingredients that I've, I've talked about, uh, looking beyond boundaries, co-authorship in the third dimension. Thank you very much.